Hi there, my name is Erin Hansen, and I'm an extension entomologist with Iowa State University. And today I'm doing a webcast from home talking about soybean aphid. I've decided to do this because I've been getting some questions about soybean aphid from people that don't normally encounter this pest. And so with this webcast, I hope to summarize how to scout for and manage this important pest. Let's get started. I hope by the end of our time together that you'll have a better understanding of how to scout for soybean aphid, implement treatment thresholds, and also raise some awareness of resistance issues that are happening for soybean aphid. Before we talk about sampling and management, I wanted to quickly review what's normal and not normal for what a soybean aphid looks like. They're small, like most aphids, about 1.5 millimeters in length. They have a bright green body with dark cornicles or tailpipes on the end of the abdomen. Like most aphids, they're pear-shaped and normally have a plump body. So what you see here is a wingless form, a colony builder, and this is typically what you're going to see in the field. She is an asexual clone and has parthenogenic reproduction all summer, so very quick, typically about 15 generations in a summer. But when they want to move long distance within a field, between fields, between states, they can generate these wing forms. So this is what the alate looks like. She's also uh, asexual female. She has dark thorax and head because she has a little bit more muscles in her body. And you can see she has clear long sails for wings that extend well past the end of her abdomen. Now sometimes I think people confuse soybean aphid for potato leafhopper nymphs. They're both common to see in soybean in some places. So some common differences, even though they have the same type of coloration, uh, potato leafhopper nymphs are not pear-shaped. They have big wedge-like head and their abdomen tapers. They don't ever have cornicles and uh, they have white eyes instead of red eyes. And lastly, if you're scouting in soybean, you'll notice that potato leafhoppers are very active. Even the nymphs try and walk or jump away from you as compared to soybean aphids that don't move around too much. So what's not normal for soybean aphid? Uh, they can be a whole range of colors, including white, yellow, orange, black, or brown. Sometimes they just look smaller, so they don't have that plump appearance. Other times they look like they're covered in cotton candy, so kind of a powdery substance. And other times they may just look fuzzy and not quite normal. So this is a sign that there might be pathogenic activity, so fungal pathogens or other pathogens in the environment that are naturally taking care of the aphids, which is a good thing. Now, if you're new to scouting for soybean aphid, I have a few tips for you. If I'm just going to a field and I wanna know if I have soybean aphid or not, so presence, absence, the first thing that I'm going to do is target my efforts on new expanding trifoliates. I'm gonna turn them over and look for wingless and winged forms on the, on the undersides of the trifoliate. And you may see some small colonies starting to develop. So if I'm looking early in the season, what I might do is actually focus my efforts on looking for ants and also lady beetles because they stand out more to me than aphids which kind of blend into the plant. If you are going into a field to try and make a treatment decision, that's a whole other thing. You want to try and be as unbiased as possible. You're walking a zigzag or a checkerboard and you're stopping at so many plants, hopefully about 30 to 40 plants per field and you're counting every aphid on the plant and you're walking away with numbers of aphids per plant in order to make a treatment decision. Signs of an outbreak or that soybean aphids have been there too long include seeing well-established colonies forming on stems. You're kicking up a lot of cast skins that are on the plant. As they feed on phloem, they're going to excrete a sugary substance called honeydew. So if you're walking through fields and they seem sticky or shiny, those plants are covered in honeydew and is also indication large colonies have been there for a while. And in some cases that honeydew can promote a black sooty mold. I've been in a few situations where I walk up to a field, notice it's fairly off color, so it's kind of gray or ashy, and it's a result of the sooty mold that is growing off the honeydew. These are just a few of the red flags that pop up for me, a point at which I hope a field never gets to. It's obvious indication those aphids have been there a really long time. Soybean aphid is an interesting pest for an entomologist because they are highly variable and considered pretty erratic, at least in Iowa. And so they're very unpredictable. They can have overlapping generations, be feeding for a very long time from emergence through senescence. And you know why some populations reach exponential growth and kind of get to the outbreak level and why fields very close to that 
maybe just never rise up to that level is still not well understood. I've been sampling soybean aphids since the very beginning in 2000. I just wanted to show you an example of how erratic they can be. Uh, over a 15 year period at this one location in northwestern Iowa, we sample every week and those ticks on the bottom just represent months. And about 50% of the time, those aphids will exceed an economic threshold, which I'll talk about later. So they're at a point at which we need to do something. But about half the time, they show up. Find them if you're looking really hard, but really not at a level in which a treatment is justified. This is a pest that really requires some diligent, regular scouting in order to make timely treatment decisions. Just because they show up does not mean they're going to reach an economic level. That was a quick recap of how to scout for soybean aphid. I do want to transition to uh, my main focus, which is integrated pest management or IPM to manage soybean aphid. So what is IPM? If you're not familiar with it, hopefully when it comes to field crops, people are using multiple proactive tactics to suppress pest populations or insects that we perceive as pests. And ultimately we want to discourage feeding and mating so that they don't have as great as impact as may be left unregulated. And when I say suppress pest pressure to acceptable levels, I understand that this is a purposely vague statement because what is acceptable to one farmer is not always acceptable to another farmer. So it's really a spectrum of risk mitigation and a lot of other factors that go into how many pests are you willing to accept on your crops. Ultimately, if people are being proactive, we're discouraging them for being unregulated, farmers can make profitable choices. And really IPM is about not only being profitable this year, but hopefully being profitable in five, 10 years, as long as you wanna farm. There's a couple of famous entomologists at Iowa State University who literally wrote the book on economic entomology. And I've adapted this graphic that they use showing different components of a successful IPM program, depending on the crop and the pest. And you can see there's a lot of components that could go into IPM. Again, hopefully being proactive and, and using a couple things at once. I spent some time looking at some of those primary factors like life cycle, identification, population dynamics, and sampling. Some of the more secondary tier components that take a little bit longer to develop and implement include things like natural enemies or sometimes a great component for IPM, host plant resistance, and cultural control, which could be simply things like data planting, seed selection, and weed control. You will see that I have pesticides in the upper left-hand corner and would really consider them a last resort when it comes to field crops. And so hopefully if we're understanding the pests, we're suppressing it the best we can with some proactive strategies, pesticides are needed on a very limited basis. But really the keystone of IPM holding everything together is the economics. So having a good understanding of how much does it take to grow that crop, all the inputs that go along with that, and how much would it cost to treat this crop if the pest population reached outbreak level? And then also more of looking forward, how much could I get for this crop looking at market values? So all those come into play when deciding when to make profitable choices. Now two big concepts that come out from that keystone of economics is economic injury level, which is defined as the lowest population density that will cause economic damage. And for field crops, it's relatively easy to know how many insects does it take before bushels per acre are being removed. And when it comes to soybean aphid, that research has been done, and in fact done several times, and it's around 675 aphids per plant is when bushels per acre start to be lost. And it's a point we never want to get to. And so what we have done is also set an economic threshold, which is a point at which we want to take action to avoid the economic injury level. And usually the economic threshold is expressed as pest density or plant injury. Normally the economic threshold is about 50 to 60% of the economic injury level, but because of the population dynamics of soybean aphid, where it can ramp up very quickly under ideal conditions, we've been very conservative in establishing an economic threshold of 250 aphids per plant. This gives you about seven days to make a timely treatment in my experience working with soybean aphid for about 20 years, I really see three tiers or approaches in which a farmer would take to manage this pest. The first level would be no scouting, pretty much a prophylactic approach where uh, they're on a prepaid program and they're relying maybe on others to make the timing and product choices for them. And so usually one or two insecticides are going out every year. Maybe they're also using a seed treatment. 
and sometimes those applications are tank mixed with other pesticides. Second level would be maybe some scouting, some spot checking, and uh, more likely to spray than not spray. So maybe even seeing a few aphids or some other things and deciding to spray. Or they rely on their neighbors or their co-ops to kind of tell them what's going on in the landscape. And this is uh, more challenging for people who have land that's spread over a couple counties. Maybe they have limited workforce or maybe they don't have uh, their own equipment to spray. So they have to get on a schedule. So they're just more likely to spray than not spray. And really the third tier, which kind of gold star when it comes to entomologists and field crops would be threshold based scouting. So those hardcore IPM people who are scouting very regularly and only treating when the aphids exceed the threshold of 250. And they've had very good luck with that over the years. And we've done some economic studies starting back when soybean aphid was new to North America, but then also validated a couple times since then. Odds of making a profit decrease when you're not incorporating scouting and not using treatment thresholds. Hopefully intuitively, this makes sense. Really the only purpose of an insecticide is to kill insects. And so there has to be some amount of pest pressure there to make a treatment worth it. They don't offer any plant health or vigor components that maybe other pesticides like fungicides do. So their only job is to knock down insects. I have a large efficacy evaluation here at Iowa State and I've been looking at traditional and maybe some innovative insecticides for soybean aphid for a long time. You can find all the summaries for my, what I call yellow books on my website, which I'll link to at the very end. I took out the treatment names because they don't necessarily matter, but I wanted to show you my reasoning for incorporating the threshold to make profitable decisions. This is a scenario in which I see many, many times. It was published in 2011. We sample from emergence through senescence on a weekly basis. And because we sample so often, what we do is convert all of our weekly counts into what we would call cumulative aphid days, which is a representation of seasonal exposure on those treatments. It's similar to how you would estimate heat units when it comes to plant growth. And what we've been able to establish is around 5,500 cumulative aphid days is when we reach the economic injury level. We've converted that aphids per plant into cumulative aphid days. And in this case, uh, I see this pattern very, very often. We have some treatments that are above 5,500 in which I would expect economic injury to occur. And then there are some treatments below. You could imagine perhaps some of those treatments aren't labeled for soybean aphids. They might be experimental. And so we're just trying to see if they work or not. But there's, there's a range there from about 15,000 all the way down to nearly zero exposure for those treatments. And what I normally see with this type of cumulative injury is significant yield loss. So if we have products that don't work, or maybe we have some that aren't treated at all, we would experience about five to 10 bushels per acre yield loss. So those treatments with the fewest amount of aphid days usually have the highest amount of yield. And we can see this pattern many, many times. We have well-timed treatment I can expect to save five to 10, sometimes even more bushels per acre with a timely treatment. On the other hand, I mentioned before, soybean aphid is an erratic pest. And sometimes aphids show up, but they never really build up to economic numbers. And in this case here in 2016, some of the top treatments only reached 1500 cumulative aphid days. So what I expect to see is not a very big yield response. And so, uh, this is exactly what happened. It's hard to pick out the top from the bottom treatments because we had very little aphid pressure on those plots. So this is uh, why I believe that, you know, treating too soon or treating too often, you're not really getting the investment back or the return on investment for those products. And then I have a third scenario here, which I've only been able to generate twice in which we have fairly high cumulative aphid day pressure. So some of the top treatments reached 30,000 aphid days, but the aphids didn't arrive until very late in the season. So they peaked during full seed set or R6. So most of the treatments reach what I would expect economic injury level to occur. In fact, it's a similar yield response to when the aphid pressure is low. I don't know enough about soybean physiology to fully understand at what point is it too late to treat, but what I have been able to generate most recently in 2019 
is that a treatment at R6 did not generate a typical 5 to 10 bushel acre yield response uh, like we do see when we're spraying at R3 or R4. So I've been talking about thresholds for quite a bit, and it's a really important part of my program at Field Crops. I only want farmers to invest input costs when there's a high likelihood of breaking even or hopefully making a profit. So by minimizing the input costs, we can improve profit margins. A lot of the products that we're using in soybean are broad spectrum. And so they, they will kill target pests and some secondary pests, but they will also have a harmful effect on beneficials and pollinators too. In some cases, you could have uh, flares of secondary pests like spider mites, which is a concern in 2020 if we have drought stress plants. So you take care of soybean aphid, but you actually end up with a higher number of spider mites and then may even have to be on a multiple spray program to try and clean up the spider mites. And we have to understand at the end of the day whether a treatment is warranted or not based on pest density and recommended treatment thresholds that an application is a chance for that pest to overcome that insecticide or that mode of action. And so we want to minimize the number of exposures or chances that pests can overcome that technology. I wanted to briefly introduce IRM or insecticide resistance management in case it's a new concept for you. There is a very nice animation on the IRAC Insecticide Resistance Action Committee website which talks about what it is and how it occurs, especially in field crops. But to briefly summarize, we want to be using high dose active ingredients. We want to limit exposures of that technology. We want to provide a refuge so that susceptible individuals can be generated to dilute the genetics of resistance in the population. And we want to alternate modes of action if possible for some crops. So normally IRM is associated with transgenic crops like BT corn for corn rootworm or European corn borer. But IRM also applies to uh, strategies like host plant resistance and also insecticides. If you're particularly interested in host plant resistance for soybean aphid, right now there are some genetics available in non-herbicide tolerant backgrounds from a few different seed catalogs. And if it is a pest that is a common occurrence for you and you're willing to go with non-herbicide tolerant backgrounds, it's a fantastic level of control. And in fact, I would call it an awesome level of control. This uh, research has been going on for many years, ever since soybean aphid was found in North America. And this is just the latest version that just came out this year. We had a couple different planting dates. So we had early, late planting date. We had some non-herbicide tolerant and Roundup Ready backgrounds. And then we have susceptible lines in the blue and resistant lines in the yellow. And remember the cumulative aphid day economic injury levels around 5,500. Through a couple years of research, we were able to, this is a summary here showing susceptible varieties almost always exceeded or approached the economic injury level. And in all cases, there's virtually no aphid accumulation. So it's a fantastic level of aphid suppression. And in fact, we've never had to use a, a foliar insecticide in these treatments because the aphids never approach the economic threshold. I just wanted to expand a bit on the modes of action or group numbers that are available for insecticides. And again, this could be found at the IRAC website, but I've tried to summarize it by color. And the color represents how the insecticide kills the insect. By far, most of the products that we're using in soybean are groups one, three, and four. They're all nerve and muscle targets. Group ones would be the carbamates and organophosphates. Group threes are the pyrethroids. And then group fours are the neonicotinoids. We have other group numbers that are available in field crops, but my guess in Iowa, probably 90 plus percent are going out there as one, threes, or fours. It's becoming easier to see what group numbers you are applying when it comes to seed treatments and foliar insecticides. They put the active ingredient and group numbers on labels. So don't assume that different trade names or different active ingredients or different group numbers. You have to look at the label to see that. And so hopefully that is something that you become more accustomed to, similar to mixing and matching herbicide groups. Uh, the group numbers are really critical. This is a timeline representing major milestones for soybean aphid in North America, first confirmed in 2000. Uh, the economic injury was observed very quickly after that. 
seed treatments were approved in soybean, and then in 2013, we had host plant resistance genes available. It, even though we have effective scouting and treatment thresholds, and we had insecticide options that did a very nice job, in 2015, there were performance issues with two different pyrethroids, bifenthrin and lambda-cyhalothrin in Minnesota. So this should be no surprise to people, especially for an asexual clone, that with repeated exposures in the landscape, eventually some of the individuals will be able to survive that exposure. So resistance to pyrethroids, or the group 3A, again was confirmed in Minnesota in 2015. We had some commercial fields in Iowa that were confirmed in 2016. And then since then, there have been confirmations in South Dakota and Manitoba as well. So usually if people are reluctant to use pyrethroids because they feel like it doesn't have the same knockdown as it did before, the alternatives are to use organophosphates and neonicotinoids. So as I said before, these three groups are heavily used and it's a lot of pressure put on a few group numbers for this persistent pest. With my yellow book, I do look at some options that are commercially available and some that are near commercial launch. So these are some products that I've evaluated. They do a great job for soybean aphid and alternatives. And depending on where you're watching from, they may or may not be labeled for your state, but there's some options there if you feel like pyrethroids aren't working and you wanna transition away from organophosphates as well. So my IPM plan for soybean aphid is, can be summarized with a few bullet points. Consider using host plant resistance if soybean aphid is a persistent pest and you're treating or more likely to treat every year or every other year. No matter what kind of seed genetics, I encourage you to scout regularly, and that means at least every week, and use the economic threshold of 250 aphids per plant to make a timely treatment. If aphids exceed the threshold, you want to strive for 100% kill with the applications, and that's really important for an asexual clone like an aphid. You want to aim for uniform coverage the best you can, and you want high volume and pressure to ultimately have small droplets make contact with the aphids, especially if they're feeding on the undersides of the leaves. Come back after the re-entry interval and check. You may have questions if the application was effective. Sometimes there's some issues with nozzles and, and volume and things like that, but then also having a lot of survivors could indicate that the product is no longer effective. I encourage people to continue to scout for resurgence or replacement. You could have aphids bounce back very quickly under ideal conditions, or they could be replaced with a pest like spider mites. If you ever have to go into the field two or more times in a single growing season, I highly recommend that you rotate the insecticide groups so that you're not exposing to the same mode of action. Also on the label, in addition to the group number, you will also see the pre-harvest interval sometimes extending up to 60 days. And so you wanna make sure that doesn't interfere with your harvest schedule for treatments that are made later in the growing season. And really the only way to know if the product was effective and timely is comparing the yield of treated versus untreated. So leaving check strips is important because oftentimes it's not just soybean aphid, you might have other flow and feeding pests. Maybe you have some pests that are considered defoliators, soybean cyst nematode, pathogens, who knows, there could be a lot of things going on in the field. It ultimately makes tough decisions if you have more than one pest going on. So assess product efficacy is highly recommended. There's a lot more information. We have a lot of the publications available on this first link, or you can use this QR code to talk about things like seed treatments. We have more information about the management of insecticide resistant soybean aphids. I also summarize all of my insecticide efficacy evaluations in a yellow book. And then uh, I do a podcast with a colleague, Matt O'Neill, for more timely uh, updates in the summertime. And then that second link is uh, for more general crop production, but I do post articles on uh, insect activity blogs and also upcoming events when that's uh, possible again. So we need your help. If you suspect you got good coverage, a good application, but you are seeing a lot of aphid survivors after foliar insecticides, please let us know. My lab will come and collect aphids and evaluate their susceptibility to pyrethroids and other insecticides. So if this is true for 2020 and beyond. Please let us know if you suspect resistance. So just circling back to learning objectives, I hope that you learned a little bit more about scouting, how to use treatment thresholds, and then also raise awareness of resistance issues 
for Soybean Aphid. I want to thank you for sticking around and listening to the entire webcast. I'm on Twitter here, also not hard to find me online if you have questions about anything I talked about today or about any other pest. I appreciate it. Thanks.